It's pretty friendly. Yeah. This one's I was fast. Yeah. I raised my hand in town. Raised my hand, yeah. yeah. But in the wall, these are not good choices. No, no, they can move quickly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Your friendly alligator is supposed to be <laughs> <It's time> to go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god. That was fast. That was pretty cool. <laughs> oh, that. Look at those quick as snakes. <laughs> Like I said, these guys do get quite large. She's about five feet right now. She'll get uh, potentially another foot, foot and a half or so. But she is a pretty big girl as she is now. Yep. <laughs> oh. oh, isn't that strange? It's really rough. So we're standing here in the middle of the wonderful reptiles exhibition, which is one of the featured exhibitions this summer at the Ontario Science Centre. You're going to have an opportunity to see some amazing reptiles and to learn even more about them. I was just uh, touching a water monitor and watching the, how amazingly quickly uh, it ate the mouse that was held out to it and it felt really cool. Uh, its skin was very bumpy but dry and it had very intelligent looking eyes. For whatever reason they're, they're purple in color. Very lovely eyes. They don't look beady or anything. No, they, 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 look they almost look uh, mammalian. They look yeah, like people's they look eyes. Quite, yeah. Can you see the eyes, kids? Because they don't come closer. But <laughs> they look really like people eyes. Yep, this lizard actually does th have three eyes, but not in the sense that we think of eyes. She's got the normal two right up in front that you can all see. Uh, but she also has an eye right up on top. And when she's back in the exhibit and you can actually see her up close, uh, you can see what it is. It's not a full eye, but it's just a little white dot. That eye allows her to pick up on light, so she can tell if it's uh, light or dark outside. It probably helps her to figure out when it's time to go out and bask. Because these guys are cold-blooded, they rely on the sun, so they have to go out when the sun's out and shining so they can warm up. There are real live animals here. You're going to see really long Burmese python. You're going to see real poisonous snakes. We have 20 species of reptiles here. We've got turtles, we've got snakes, we've got lizards, and we've got crocodiles and alligators. Some of you will remember that two years ago, the Ontario Science Center had an exhibition in the summer called Lizards and Snakes Alive. Um, what you'll find in this year's exhibition is some of the uh, species you'll see will be the same, but there are also uh, different uh, species and you will learn even more about reptiles and what they contribute to the world. Who here is afraid of snakes? <laughs> Pretty same proportion we find at the population. About 50% of the people say they're afraid of snakes. The other 50% are usually lying. Um, <laughs> the, the fact is that a lot of people are afraid of reptiles, and that's really the purpose of this exhibit. Uh, reptiles, the beautiful and the deadly, because sometimes the deadliest animals on this planet can also be some, some of the most beautiful. Uh, those two qualities that a lot of reptiles share is what has gotten them into trouble. For one, a lot of them are very, very beautiful. So they are overcollected, not just for things like their skins and for uh, mounts and for private collectors and for uh, private owners are taken out of their natural habitat, but also because they are potentially deadly. And so a lot of them are killed out of fear, even the ones that aren't particularly dangerous. And so for all the people out there that are afraid of reptiles, most particularly snakes, this exhibit is to try and open your eyes a little bit because we found that the antidote to fear is understanding. And so the more we understand about an animal, the less likely we are to fear it. It's also to kind of garner some 
uh, appreciation for the animal because the, the more we see these animals and more we can recognize just how beautiful they are, uh, the more that motivates us to want to conserve these animals and the places that they live. Now they call these guys bearded dragons or bearded lizards sometimes uh, because of that little puff of skin you see underneath his jaws there and it's, it's flat right now but if he gets nervous, if a predator comes along or if another male comes along in a threatening way, he'll fill that little gullet up with air, he'll puff that beard out and it looks like he has that big bristly beard going across. Now these bristles, they really aren't very hard, they don't do any damage, but it kind of makes him look a little unappetizing, looks like he's covered in thorns, and so that's going to help protect him from predators. In the morning, when that morning mist comes in, that bristly skin will collect little dew drops that he can drink off of himself. That combined with some of the food he likes to eat, like insects and sometimes plants and stuff like that, means that he really never has to drink from a standing water source. So it really allows him to live in those very harsh desert environments. See, these guys, they don't go off of smell like snakes do. They go off of their eyesight. Me and Nick were having a staring Oh, there's an exhibit I want to talk to you about. Croc talk. Do you know that crocodiles make lots of different sounds? Can you make crocodile sounds for me? Talk like a crocodile? That's true. That's what. Amaze your friends. You say, <laughs> they say, what are you doing? We're talking like a crocodile. How can you tell the difference between an alligator and a crocodile? We have a wonderful interactive uh, right inside that doorway, actually. So when we go in to see the animals, we can uh, see that one. It's the very first or second thing that we'll be looking at. Uh, but essentially, it comes down to the way their heads look. Uh, that's that's going to be the big thing that tells it apart. The most interesting part of this exhibit is the snakes. They're kind of scary, but they're really cool because how they, how long they are and how fat they are and how much they can eat, it's really cool. I love this exhibit. How do snakes smell from their tongues? It's actually a really cool system that snakes have invented to do this, but it's not just in the snakes. You'll actually see with one and maybe two species of the lizards we have on this exhibit, they also smell with their tongues. Well, what is it about a snake's tongue that allows it to smell? Well, it really isn't even the tongue at all. It's a special organ that the snake has on the roof of its mouth. It's called the Jacobs's organ, but for all intents and purposes, it's like a second nose. So when the snake flicks its tongue out, its tongue collects all these scent particles and pheromones and smells in the air, brings it back into the mouth, brushes those smells up against that Jacobson's organ, and then that organ sends messages to the brain to tell them what the animal is smelling. All right, a couple of people. A GPS system helps us get to where we're going. The snake's tongue does exactly the same job because he has the two forks that stick out. If that smell comes in a little stronger on the right or the left-hand side, he knows exactly which way to turn to go after his food. And so when he moves his head around, he'll flick out that tongue. Once that smell comes in just as equal on the right and left sides, he knows that if he goes straight ahead, he's gonna find dinner. I would like the rattlesnakes and the turtles because the rattlesnakes, they're cool. They're cool because you got to feel them. And turtles, they they like to hide and I, I like finding them when they hide. The most dangerous or the most venomous snake on earth? Um, well, I can tell you, speaking from experience, the most dangerous snake on earth is the one you don't see. Uh, it's it's going to be the one that blindsides you that's going to do some damage. If you see the snake from a distance, chances are you're going to be okay. Uh, but if we're looking just strictly in terms of the snake, uh, even that's kind of hard to pinpoint. There are snakes with the most toxic venom on the planet, but they don't come into contact with people very often. The sea snakes that live in the Pacific Ocean have the most toxic venom of any animal that we've studied. Uh, but they all live out in the ocean, so very few people are bitten by them. Uh, we have super aggressive snakes that live in Asia and Africa, and their venom isn't necessarily that toxic. And then we have relatively docile snakes like the Gaboon Viper that just has so much venom that it kills very, very quickly and it's very, very damaging. Uh, and so we do have a, another interactive here on the exhibit where you can kind of look at different qualities. Uh, how dangerous is the venom? How much do they deliver? How aggressive is the snake? To really kind of tell us what are the most dangerous groups of snakes. Uh, as far as we you know, can tell there are the cobras and the, a certain number of vipers that live in, in Central Asia have killed the most people, but that's really just because of where they live. I learned lots of things like mimicry. Mimicry means like an, a, a different type of animal, like a snake, develops over a long period of time period of time to change into another uh, a, a snake that's more 
uh, dangerous and poisonous and I learned that some snakes are more stronger than others and there's lots of uh, there's lots of kind of species and uh, some are getting extinct every year. Are there any mimicry snakes here? I'm really really glad you asked because we do have a, a really fantastic mimic. Uh, a mimic is an animal that kind of copies another animal and uh, we see this in a wide variety of animals. We see it down in the tropical rainforest with frogs. Uh, if you guys have ever heard of poison dart frogs, those are the ones that you don't want to eat, you don't want to touch because they can kill you just by uh, getting some of that toxin on you. Uh, there are completely harmless frogs that live down in the Amazon that look very, very similar. And they are basically just pretending to be these dangerous frogs uh, to protect themselves. We also see it in butterflies. We all know the monarch butterfly, really big, beautiful butterfly that we have right here in Ontario. It's not necessarily toxic, but it's a really bad tasting butterfly. It tastes really nasty if you're a bird that tries to eat it. Well, there's another species called the viceroy that looks near identical to the monarch. And it's, you know, from what I've heard, a very tasty butterfly, but because of the way it's colored, birds don't touch it. We also see that in snakes. So right here on this exhibit, we have a natural mimic for a venomous snake. Now this snake is completely harmless. It's what's known as a milk snake, but it lives in the same area as coral snakes, which are very, very, very dangerous. Uh, they have a very powerful neurotoxin. That means that they paralyze with that venom. These milk snakes are completely harmless, but as they've lived in the same area as these coral snakes for long, long periods of time, the species has slowly started to resemble it. Uh, and so now we have anywhere that we find coral snakes and milk snakes living in an area, we're going to find that they look very, very similar, even though that they can differ from area to area. Tortoises are, 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 have almost more than a million years old because there were from the dinosaur age, so like turtles are, they have a very strong shell that, that they can survive for many, many years. I would like to have one turtle at home because they're, they're not dangerous and they're like, they are very good. Why are reptiles cold-blooded? Uh, well, uh, an evolutionary biologist would say because they haven't evolved warm-bloodedness yet. Uh, reptiles are cold-blooded because it works for them. Uh, they, there are some that aren't necessarily cold-blooded. There are pythons that will shiver and generate body heat to incubate their eggs. Uh, there are sea turtles that have a layer of blubber, just like a, a whale, to help keep them warm and insulates them and so that they can generate their own body heat uh, about 10 degrees higher than the, the ocean water around them. But most reptiles are cold-blooded. Uh, because that's what works. They, they've managed to survive long enough being cold-blooded. Uh, that of course means that they can't generate their own body heat. So they've really never had another reason to adapt to warm-blooded. Why do they have different patterns? Uh, well, certain reptiles use their patterns for camouflage, uh, and so they tend to resemble the, the environment where they're living. Uh, certain ones, like those mimics that we talked about, have their pa patterns because they, they look uh, like dangerous snakes, and even something like the coral snake that is very brightly colored. That's an animal that really doesn't need to be hiding. He's a very dangerous, uh, venomous animal. And so he's actually advertising. He's a little arrogant. He's saying, look, I really don't care if you can see me. I am so toxic, I'll stick out like a sore thumb. And so they have these bright yellow and red colorations. They live in the leaf litter and in moss, so they really do stick out, but they know that other animals know not to touch them. I like this exhibition because it's very interesting. Actually, there's a lot of extinct animals. Did you guys know that more than 99% of the animals that have ever lived on this planet are gone? And that's not just the dinosaurs, that's uh, all the animals that lived in the Ice Age, like woolly mammoths and woolly rhinoceros, uh, even smaller animals that lived millions and millions of years ago. Uh, but as far as what we have today, uh, there are species of snakes going extinct every single year. Uh, the, the number one root cause of it is loss of habitat. Uh, a lot of snake species live in the rainforest. That's where we find a majority of the snake species. Uh, and so as that rainforest gets deforested, they're losing a lot of their homes. And so a lot of species will be dying out over the next century or so. We are very, very happy to have this show. It's opening right, right in a couple of days here, and we're going to have it here till September. And we really hope that all of you are going to see it and bring your friends. We know that it is a special thing. We have lots of live exhibits here at the Science Center, but this one is really, really, really special for us. So the Reptiles Exhibition is just one of the uh, featured products that's available to all visitors to the Ontario Science Center this summer, and it is free with your general admission ticket. So we look forward to seeing you here.